I'm reading from Psalms 126. Psalms 126. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we was like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. For off we are glad. Turn it again out of captivity, O Lord, as the stream in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This week has been an emotional week for me. It has been the fulfillment of a dream. You know, I could say this morning that I've had a dream too. Had a dream too. Uh, that dream began to be dreamed in my life back in 1957. When here in Pasadena, right here on a little street that might even be gone, it's called Blake Street, in a little old holiness mission, I heard for the first time in my life that God loved me. Uh, I was born in Mississippi in 1930. My mother died when I was seven months old. My father gave the five of us away to his mother, and my grandmother had been the mother of 19 children. I grew up in the poverty of the South. Uh, I dropped out of school when I was somewhere between the third and the in the fifth grade and never went back to school. I began to be motivated at an early age. I, I worked a whole day once hauling hay for a white gentleman. This was the beginning of my motivation and my education. For a whole day expecting to get about a dollar and a half for that day's work. At the end of that day he, he gave me 15 cents. And that began me to think in. It began me to look at our social economic system, how it was framed. It was that time that I began to see that in Mississippi that I was still a, a semi-slave. I began to ask the question, how was this man able to exploit me? How was he able to take advantage of my life? I began to look around him. I could see that he owned the mules, he owned the wagon, he owned the hay, he owned the field. He had the means of production, and all I had was my needs and my wants and my labor, and I had no control of my labor. And I began to say, what can I do to, to change this? How can I change this? Begin my thinking in life. Well, I ended up leaving Mississippi after my oldest brother, my grandmother, gave away three of the kids. Uh, she kept uh, two, my oldest brother, because he was old enough to plow. We were sharecroppers. Sharecroppers was a system that was developed after the emancipation for landless black. And that system was not broken until 1965 in Mississippi because most of the Southern Constitution said one person, one vote. And so black folks did not become persons in Mississippi until 1965 when they got the right to vote. My brother went into the service during World War II. He spent his time in the service, came out. Our life got better when the war came and my brother was sending a, and my uncle was sending a check to my grandmother for being in the service. So our life got better. My brother came out of the service and, and, and he was very dear to me. He was the dearest because we had grew up together. 
And he was home for about six months, and he was killed on a racial campaign. And that's when my whole family then began to migrate from Mississippi. I migrated to Monrovia, California. This is where I developed as a young man in Southern California. I never intended to go back to uh, Mississippi to live. But then something happened that changed my life, revolutionized my life. Uh, in 1957, I went to a little old, this little holiness mission. And they were studying the life of the Apostle Paul. That really intrigued me. What intrigued me was, I'm not a religious person. I did not grow up in a religious environment. Uh, I was in Mississippi. I would see these churches, these big, large, white congregation churches. They would say, uh, you'd see signs that would say, Revival today, everybody welcome. If I didn't want that, it would have been a riot. So everybody didn't mean everybody. I go to the black congregation churches. And that they would be talking about dead people and emotional and happy about it. And I did not see how all of that related to the misery and the poverty that we were in. And I really began to see religion when I came here about that time. Sort of like, probably like Karl Marx. Sort of as the open of the people. Had very little to do with changing the behavior of people. But I went to this little Sunday school. As I say, we were studying a lot of the Apostle Paul, and what intrigued me was this guy suffering for religion. Why would somebody suffer for religion? I thought religion was something you suffer with, not for. And here was this person suffering. But I began to go to this Sunday school and begin to teach and begin to learn. And we came in this Bible to Galatians 2.20, where Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lived in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. See, so growing up without a mother, growing up without a father, you grew up without the institution of love. Uh, that's what the family is all about. The sociologists and psychologists just now begin to understand uh, the race relationship uh, of, of, of the father and the family. Uh, to crime and all the behavior, much of the behavior in our society. In the prisons that I work now and go and work, almost 90% of the guys in prison grew up without a father's influence in their life. And so I grew up without that love. And then I heard that God loved me. That God had loved me and had sent his only begotten son into the world to die for me. Boy, for God loved me that much, I had to respond. And that Sunday morning, in that little holiness mission, the best way I knew how, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It, it changed, transformed my life. If I could have sung that morning, I would have said, Hallelujah, I have found him, whom my soul so long had treasured. And so I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and I was discipled. I began to be discipled. An old Lincoln Avenue Presbyterian elder discipled me. Yeah. He dreamed his dream. He was a Bible teacher, and he trained people in reaching children in the Bible. And, and that he had wanted so much here in Pasadena and these surrounding cities to reach the, the black community. But he also had this deep understanding of, of, of indigenous leadership development. Like he, he discipled me in that idea that, that, that people from those communities needed to be the ones that really go in there and lead the way. And so when I wanted to go to Bible school, but he really understood that Really, with a guy with a third grade education, might not be able to matriculate at a Bible college. And so he said to me, let me teach you. And he began to teach me. He began to dream his dream in my life. That's what discipleship is about. That's what the blessing is about. That's what the Old Testament blessing was about. 
When God met Abraham, he gave him a task that was too big for him. He says that Abraham, through you, all the families of the earth is going to be blessed. And so when Abraham got old, he realized he couldn't carry out that task, so he blessed Isaac. And when Isaac got old, he recognized that he blessed Jacob. Jacob blessed the twelve. So the blessing is in discipleship is to dream in others that unfinished task. And so he dreamed his dream in me. And it's only been here recently that I would ever talk about that because this old man shared it with me. Not only did he share it with me the word of God, but he put within me hope. He affirmed my dignity. He let me know that someday I would not only be speaking to black people, white people, but I would be speaking to people all over the world. He just nurtured that in me. He nurtured that in me. I would never say that because it was, it was, it was too grand for me to even believe it. I wanted to believe it, but I, it was hard. But somehow I think I embraced it because he taught it to me. He used two basic Bible verses to shake my life. One was Acts 1-8. That's where Jesus said to the disciples. These were the last words of Jesus before he ascended back to heaven. He said, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He helped me understand the first work of the Holy Spirit was to give us the courage of our conviction so that we could do the task that God had for us. And that task was to be a witness to the world. I'm so glad that I did not make the Holy Spirit a booger man, uh, uh, make the Holy Spirit something that was over, uh, give me over sensation. But the idea of the Holy Spirit was to lead and to guide us into all truth and to help us to understand and love Jesus and help us to carry out his commission of carrying the gospel to Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of the world. He helped me to understand that. To understand that. And so he dreamed in me. Then there was a second verse he used in my life. And that was Second Timothy 2.2. 2. And that verse says something like this. Paul is talking to Timothy, one of his disciples. And he says, that which you have heard of me among many witnesses, that you are responsible to commit to other people who shall be able to teach others also. I would find out later that he laid the foundation in me for indigenous leadership development. He laid the foundation in me that the whole idea that the people you disciple is to go beyond what you could do in life, but to carry on your vision and their own vision in the world. So he discipled me in that. And then, of course, I was loved. I was converted at a significant time in Southern California. Uh, it was a time when the Billy Graham crusade had gone on. It was a time when, in this San Gabriel Valley, there was sort of a biblical evangelical, you could even call it a fundamentalist movement in, in, the, in, the, in this valley uh, as a part of it. And there was men. I got involved with Christian businessmen. Southern California. And these men love me. They embrace me. I love this place. I love this place. They, they prepared me to go back to Mississippi. I was able to see love across racial barriers because I was loved. John McGill, Ted Ingstam, Steve Lazarin, I could just go on and on. Herbert Hawkins, uh, on and on. Dr. Lake sitting here. And all of these people, they embraced me. And they loved me. And they loved me unconditional. Sometimes I would really try to uh, understand why they was so concerned about my own well-being in life. And then I felt call of God 
there was a group of men had some, they would go up into the mountain up here and to, in the Sunday morning early to these prison camps. And they invited me to go up. I had just been converted, and I was just telling people. When I was converted, I, I had an opportunity to, 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 to share my testimony almost every place. These businessmen, these other groups would invite me to come in. I would share my faith. I, I went to a Seventh-day Adventist church, a Catholic church. All the, They would invite me to come in and, and, and to share. And they asked me to come up to this mountain to share with some, to share the gospel with these teenagers. And I went up there and I shared my testimony. I shared a little of what I'm sharing this morning. And when I was sharing, uh, two young men, just as I was finishing, two young men in the back of the congregation, a young black boy, they must have been about 13 or 14. And I noticed that they were just crying, just weeping, weeping. And so much so, I, when I finished, I went back there to sit between them, to embrace them, and to ask them, try to find out. Uh, I had been through nothing like this. I didn't know what the spirit could do to people and cause people to do all that. I didn't understand that. And so I went back to get with them. And they began to share it with me. When you shared your life with me, you was really just depicting my own life. And that was the first time that I realized uh, that sharing the gospel, that, that, that sharing the gospel uh, with people, and sharing your life with people could really have an impact. And the Word of God was quick. It was living. It was powerful. And so that gave me the inspiration that I wanted to share in my life. And I began to think about it. And then I began to remember my home, back home. I look back now, many years later, and I ask myself, and people ask me all the time, what motivated you to go back home? I, I think what motivated me to go back was, as I began to think of what my life had been like, and what I, who I was now, I think I went back in gratitude. And I really think that I respond in terms of mission, it ought to come out of our gratitude of really being loved by God. And not only being loved by God, but being loved by people. I don't, that is important. Love must be incarnated in other people. And so I left my rewarding job. Uh, I love my job. I love the people that I work with. But I left and went back to Mississippi. And I ended up in a little town called Mendenhall. It was there in Mendenhall that I was able to see what had happened to the church in Mississippi. And I'm going to discover later that it happened to the church throughout America. I became a friend to a, a First Baptist pastor in Mendenhall. And I shared with him about them sending missionaries to Africa, but there was absolutely no relationship between he and I in this little town. And, and there was no relationship, especially now in the 60s, between black Christian and white Christian because the civil rights movement was on in the South. And they were fearful of each other. And anybody in Mississippi who wanted their civil rights was a communist. And white folk was afraid to be associated with these black communists who was going to overthrow the government and take it over. And so there was this fear. Not only that, but the church in Mississippi, the Southern Baptist Church, became the official stewards to maintain segregation in the South. When, when the internal revenue took the private schools away from them after they all went out of the public school into the private school, and the government took their tax exempt away, they gave it to the Baptist Church. And the Baptist Church then became the official stewards to guard segregation in Mississippi. That's the situation that we were in. And they were preaching loud about the Bible, but themselves were maintaining segregation in the state. And I began to see what had happened to us as a people. My friend, 
that we began to meet. And I was dealing with him, and I, and I met another friend who was a pastor of a, a, a Presbyterian church. And we both had become friends. And I was telling him what I was going to do in Minnie Hall. I said to him, this is what I want to do in Minnie Hall. I could see that for the young blacks in that town, success was to leave that little ghetto and not come back. What was happening, all the folks that had skills and had a good opportunity, man, as soon as they could, they would get out of town. Uh, out of high school there had uh, about 80 school teachers that was teaching there. There's only one of them lived in that town. The rest, to be successful, you had to come from somewhere else. There was no hope of being successful and living in that town. And I began to see that I said to my friends, as I would talk to them, I said, this is what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to stay in this little town of Mendenhall long enough that I can win some of these young people to Jesus Christ. I want to disciple them in their faith like I had been discipled. I want to help them to stay in school, go off to college, get some skills, and bring these skills back to the neighborhood. It took us almost 12 years to do that. But it happened. But it happened. In the meantime, we be try, began to try to respond to some of the needs of the people within the neighborhood, within the community. We began to work with the farmers to help them to purchase fertilizer and make their crops better. Uh, we began to see the health needs in the community. And Dr. Lake was the first doctor that came down and opened our first health center that we opened in this So we began to do service in the community. That was giving those young folks hope that they would come back. But as I began to talk to my friend about it, and he began to go back to his church, and he really wanted to help me, both of these friends. But the church so rejected him that my friend, Dr. O'Neill, committed suicide. Then I began to see the trap of religion. I began to see some of the sickness that you can see in religion. You can see that in Bin Laden. You can see that in the snipers. You can see that in the sickness. What religion can go bad in people, in society. I saw that sickness there in Mississippi. They had taken this precious gospel, th this love of God, this gospel that's the power of God and salvation, this gospel that's supposed to burn through racial, culture, and the gospel that lost its power. And what we had was a form of religion, an economic barrier. This gospel, this love that's supposed to bring us together, that the world would know we was Christian because of our love one for another. We had taken that gospel, we had put it into our race and into our culture. We had become centric to deny the power of God. And that's when I begin to say, I want to preach a religion that is stronger than my race. I want to preach a religion that is stronger than my culture. I want to preach a religion that can be engaged me and reaching out to the poor. I want to preach a religion that, that reform that is like Jesus told us, that we the main our main focus was to be focused on the people in need in society. And so I begin to do that. But I know I was one-sided, and I know that I had to begin to get more focus on trying to get Dolphus and Otis and Rose and Carolyn and all those young folks out into college. And so for the next five or six years, I was doing that. But it came home to me, the absolute sickness of racism and bigotry. On February the 7th. 21 of us were locked in a jail there in Brandon, and we was almost beaten to death. That's when I saw the pain. I said this other day, I don't have a little inkling of what, it, what makes a terrorist. I have a little inkling of it. When there's all hope is gone, and when you are hopeless, I had thought what I was doing was hopeless, and now I was met by the force of segregation, by the laws of Mississippi. It put me in jail, and there they were almost beating me to death, and I thought my life was gone. All of my dream, all of my hope was gone. Yes, yes, yes. 
If I would have had a stick of Dun & Mice, I would have put it around myself and blew myself up. Take a people. Take all of their hope away. Don't take a people that don't have no future. Take a people that the whole world is against them. Look at those Palestine people. Oh, yes. There is no doubt that Jewish people need a homeland. Everybody need a homeland. That's what I'm talking about. Everybody needs their dignity affirmed. But take people who were born in those camps, very limited, no hope, and why? You can get a little inking. Oh, and man, it was worse because I had tasted of freedom. I, I, I had thought that we could be brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. I had experienced the love of my brothers and sisters in California. They had supported me and my big family all these years. There was ladies at Christmas time. We would write letters to them, and they would, our children would tell them exactly what they wanted for Christmas. And those ladies would pack boxes and clothing and took care of it. And these were white people, black folks, and others in California. So I knew that Christ's love was stronger than racism in society. But I'd experienced that. But now I'm a dead man. My dream is gone. My dream is gone. I made a promise in that jail. Now I, this was, I know I was bribing God. I know that. I know I was trying to bribe God. Because I was in a hopeless, awful situation. I, I saw the sickness of racism and bigotry. I saw the way those guys brutalized us in that jail. And, and I, it had a, a sexual dimension. They wanted to destroy us sexually. There, there's something about racism and bigotry that is reinforced by our sex behavior. And, they was, and we just had to ball up on the floor to avoid being totally destroyed as human beings. I saw what hatred could do to people. And I began to say, I said, God, if you'll let me out of this jail tonight, I want to put your gospel down. I don't want to change blacks, but I want to put your gospel down and change whites. Then we are all trapped in this thing together. Racism and bigotry and tribalism don't have any barriers. It's in all of us. It was in me. It was in me. And I think what called me that night to really come out with this conviction, I, I, I saw it in me. I said to me, it's not in me. I, I think that you, when a person repents, and when a person is brought under conviction, I, I, I think they see themselves honestly. I think God shined the spotlight into my own soul. And I was able to see that I did not want this. And I could see, though, it was in me. My most, I, I, want, I really wanted to get back. That was my thought. That was a thought of me being, being a terrorist. I wanted to get back. I could see that was in my heart was just as dark as what was in their heart. I came out of the prison. God blessed me to come out of the prison. Went back to Minnesota. I saw the continued what I was doing, and I began to learn. And so I stayed there for 12 years, and then I left there. Developed a little community there. Uh, then I went to Minnesota, went to Jackson, and developed a little community there. They tried to respond to the needs of the people. I discovered something there from reading uh, the Gospel of John, chapter four that if you can meet people around their deepest needs, if you can love them around their needs as they perceive it, people will see that you love them. They will sense that love, and they'll respond to it. If we begin to work with people and meet the needs that we perceive to be their needs, that creates a sort of dependence. We feel better than they feel about what we are giving them. 
And so you've got to make certain when you're working with people, you're working with them around their deepest self. I could see that. And that's the way our development started. Healthcare developed. Uh, uh, thrift stores developed. And one of the things that we tried to do, we tried to limit it. I would just give it to people. That undermined their dignity. We wanted them to participate in and join with and to bring some ownership within what it was we were doing in the community. We used this little Chinese poem to explain our philosophy of ministry. And CCD have adopted this. It goes something like this, that you have to go to the people. You have to live among them. You have to love them. You have to learn with them. Learn from them. You have to plan with them. You have to start with what they know, and you have to build on what they have. So when the best leaders leave, the people need to say, we have done it ourselves. How could we do that? When we left the Minden Hall, then I began, we began to reflect and went to Jackson to start a new ministry in Jackson. Because by this time, the young folk was, instead of going away to school, out of the state now, and by this time, they were going into the state, going to the local college. And so we said we'd start a ministry somewhere near the college. Our goal was that if we could reach these young folks near the college and that we could win them to Jesus Christ and, and share with them the concepts that we had learned in Mendenhall, that they would go back to the villages. Because now, by this time, Dolphins and Otis and Rose and others have taken over that ministry. And so this might could become a model for other ministries in the state. So that was the idea there. And what was that philosophy? How did we implement that? It's what we call the three R's of Christian community government. This is our philosophy. This is how CCDA came into being. That's why there are 700 or so other ministries like this. And we've just been meeting here, learning from each other. And we really want to bring people together who was out there in the trenches, who was doing the work, that we could learn from each other, that we could inspire each other. We can look at each other's models. You know, we can look at the mistakes that we have made. And we can look at other ministries that were successful. What was the philosophy? The first hour was we call relocation. My first step was to get those young people back in the village. You've got to anchor some leadership in the village. In order for ministry to be successful, uh, the, the people who primarily lead the ministry must live within the village. That's the weakness in the urban church. That, that's the weakness in the churches in downtown L.A. That's the weakness. You can see seven or eight churches in one block if you go down there. But those pastors, many of them, and some of them even live out, live out in Marina Valley. That is primarily a building down there. It is not a parish. It is not a place where people are incarnate their life in the neighborhood. And, and want to see this neighborhood improve. Uh, the churches have overcommuted itself. It's an overcommuted church. What makes this church here successful is it has made a commitment to stay in this neighborhood. It has made a commitment to reach out in this neighborhood. And yes, this church is turning brown. It will turn brown because the neighborhood is turning brown. But it's so wonderful. What you want it to be is a reconciling center. You want it to come, be a place where people come and feel each other's love and be enriched by other cultures. Oh, we go to the opera houses and we go all these places and we talk about culture and all that stuff. And we have the greatest opportunity here to experience people who are different from us so that our lives can be enriched. Not only that, but we'll be trying to answer Jesus' prayer that we might be one. That the world would know we are Christian because of the love we have one for another. So that first power would be okay. The second one is reconciliation. Now, if you don't believe in reconciliation, I mean, reconciliation should never be a subcommittee of a church. It, it should never be a, a, a fraternity within the church. Because then you can commit, you don't have to do it. This fraternity is going to do it. 
This group is going to do it. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and giving us all the ministry of reconciliation. That's our work. To see people reconciled to Jesus Christ. That's why he came. That's why he had to be incarnated. He had to become one like us. He had to come into our world. He had to live among us. And so reconciliation is the key. The key. The church has got to be there. We've got to move it there. And this world, this whole world, is becoming more multicultural. And I remember, almost finished. I remember two years ago, I went to Amman, Jordan, to an international peace conference. And Congressman Tony Hall introduced Tommy Tarrant and I, the former Ku Klux Klan. And we were the keynote speaker for a five-day conference in Amman, Jordan. And Representative Hall said, he said that there's 42 walls going on in the world. And he said, all of those walls either ethnic, racial, tribal, war. Jesus has sent us, has called us as his reconciling force in the world. We are his ambassadors. But we are to be the reconciling, we are to be the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So as he said, the last and final are that's our philosophy and ministry, the last hour, the third hour, is what we call redistribution. I remember when I used to say that before, and I used to say it in Lake Avenue Church. And when I was saying in Lake Avenue Church here, boy, people would start looking at each other. They said, he must be a communist. And what did he mean, taking all the money from the rich and giving it to the poor? And I would always say, that would be the most foolish thing you could ever do. If you take all the money from the rich and give it to the poor, the rich would have it back tomorrow night. Because the poor would go out and buy used Mercedes. I mean, that's no redistribution. There is, there is, money is makeable. We create money. Money is made out of motivation, ideas, skills, education. That's what the poor need. The poor need hope. The poor need motivation. The poor need education. The poor need models that they can see. So when we talk about redistribution, we're talking about how can we come along the side of the people. And you are doing it here. That's what made Harambe. That's what made all of the ministry. Is it churches like this came along the side. Let me close with my text. They that goeth forth weepeth. Barren, precious seed. The seed in the Bible is the word of God. That we are born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. By the word of God, which lives in the Bible. Forever. We never want our social environment to be a substitute for the proclamation of the word of God. We never want our social goodwill to be a substitute for our own outliving of our own lives and trying to live it with a sense of morality. Because the Bible says that God is a spirit and we that trust him must worship him in spirit and in truth in society. Character is truth embodied in a person. Truth embodied in their skills. Truth embodied in their behavior, in life. They can do something well in the society. So, I just want to say this in closing. And you know, I want to thank all of you folks. I want to say, I might not, I know I will never get this situation out again. I know I get a chance probably to preach again, but never with the idea that all of these folks that I've been working with for the last 15 or 20 years, the CCDA people would be here. You folks not only helped me to go out to Mississippi, you helped me when I came back to Pasadena, you have helped me as I went out to sow the seed around the United States with CCDA. And so we have went for us weekly, bearing the 
special seed to the Word of God. And this weekend, we came back here rejoicing together, friend us. So I want to thank you. There are, I, I will not attempt to call names. The names are too great in this fellowship. Names are too great. And so I am eternal grateful. Yes, I'm still a missionary in Mississippi. Um, always, but when I really come back um, come back to Pasadena, and when I turn off on Fair Oaks up there and come out through, I mean, on Grove, there is a feeling that I get that I get nowhere else. And that's a feeling of gratitude. That there are people who embrace me and who love me and gave me an opportunity to live out a dream. Live out a dream. And you folks have kept that dream to become a real. That's right. Father, I thank you for your goodness, your grace. I thank you for Lake Avenue. Thank you for Pastor Kirk. Thank you for Andy. Thank you for all the elders, the people here. And Lord, I thank you for this example here. And then, Lord, I thank you for all the friends who have been my friends. And Lord, I thank you that I've been able to live with a little sense of confidence. Confidence. Because of the love that I feel for my friends. So bless us. Use us. In Jesus' name.